Thank you. And, and anybody in the Dallas area that's not already fostering for Dallas Pets Alive, um, I encourage you to reach out to them. They're an amazing, amazing group. Okay. Everybody ready to get started with this popular topic here? Let me get us going here. Um, so, you know, we talk a lot about what to talk about when we do these webinars. And I got to tell you that cat inner cat aggression is one of the most common calls I get for behavior cases. And it usually is stemming from somebody bringing a new cat in or two cats that have gotten along and then all of a sudden have stopped gotten, getting along and they reach out sometimes after these cats have been fighting for years, sadly. And really what I have found is that they don't really wanna know how to, the process for introducing cats. They, they want a quick fix. And sadly, I got to tell you, there is no quick or easy or short way to properly introduce cats. And so if you came here today looking for that, go ahead and hang up now. Wait, where'd everybody go? <laughs> it is, it is a, 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 a process that you need to be committed to. So, and it's complex and there's a lot of moving parts, but I have a method that works and I promise it works if you take the time to do the steps. So let's jump in here. So first of all, a little bit about me, for those of you who aren't familiar, I'm a certified feline training and behavior specialist and I, and I have a consulting business, um, Cat Behavior Solutions. I do a lot of work in shelters across the country to help train staff and volunteers how to work with the difficult cats that are in the shelter, but mostly I'm dedicated to shelter diversion. I wanna help those people keep cats in their home. And cat aggression is a really big reason that people surrender cats or return cats, sadly. Thankfully, you know, there's not huge return rates, but when there are, I'd say probably 80% of those are, well, like it didn't get along with my other cat. So this is a, a very good topic. I also host a weekly radio show. It's a podcast called Cat Talk Radio. We have, I think, 138 episodes now. So it's, we've pretty much got a topic for everything. And because there's 138, if you go out there and you're something specific, that you're looking for, you can't find, just drop me an email and I'm happy to point you in the right direction with a direct link. So let's jump in here. So let's start with what is required for a successful cat introduction. A gradual stepwise approach, which we're gonna go over today. Your ability to really read cat body language well and an understanding that some cats just aren't ever gonna get along. Some are never gonna be friends. Some are never gonna share litter boxes, even after years of trying. So there are cases where certain cats just don't get along with each other. And I've even seen like cats like this cat, but not this other cat. So they are very much individuals like us. You know, we, we don't like everybody we run into. And patience in huge, amazing large doses, you need patience for this process, all right? So why is this process so difficult, right? Well, let me tell you, it's, it's mostly because of cat's nature, they have evolved as a solitary species. A lot of us, you know, we, we think about cats as dogs, right? And dogs have evolved with a social hierarchy. So they like other dogs and they like to have status in place and to have all that very well defined and they and they communicate socially well cats don't right in the wild they they're a very solitary species they only come together for breeding and the mom will kick the kittens out after about five months of age so cats are not used to being with one another or communicating well with one another another cat is always seen as a territory invader. And, and this is important because from both sides, it, you know, your home cat 
is like, oh my gosh, another cat has come in and invaded my territory. And the new cat is like, oh my God, I've been plopped down in the middle of someone else's territory and trapped in here. And now I've got to fight for resources. And, and a good way to look at this is when you have a colony of cats, a, a non-member of the colony will sit way outside the out outskirts before approaching, right? And, and so this also, your home does not allow for that, that natural instinctive distance. You know, we tend to put them together much closer and much sooner than they're ready. And a new cat has no idea if it's gonna have to fight for territory. It's gonna assume that it is. So that makes it difficult. So introduction circumstances, some reasons why you guys are here and what you'll find with other people. Obviously temporary fosters. You got a new cat, a reintroduction of two cats. And that'll happen when they either haven't been introduced properly in the first time. A lot of people will go, well, I'm so confused because these cats have gotten along great and now all of a sudden they're not. Well, if they hurried through that introduction process or didn't do it properly, then oftentimes cats need a reintroduction. Or if there's redirected aggression. So that, what that means is if your cats are seeing outside cats and they don't know those cats can't get in the house, then they think, oh my God, territory invaders, they're coming in and they're all dialed up and they're watching those cats. And then the other cat walks by and brushes against them and they're like, ah, and freak out and attack them. So re redirected aggression is often a need for a reintroduction. And non-recognition aggression, now, this one is common. I hear, I get lots of emails. So I took my cat to the vet and I brought it home and all of a sudden they're fighting like crazy. Well, that's because if a cat leaves the territory and comes back smelling different, the home cat won't recognize it. And it's because cats live through their noses. They rely on scent so much more heavily than they do eyesight or hearing or any of their other senses that that cat doesn't smell right. And so, you know, there must be a strange cat and then they react defensively. So I have techniques for that. We won't cover that today because that's kind of a different thing. But if you have cats you need to take out or you have one indoor outdoor cat, a lot of times it'll come back smelling different and they'll tussle. And if you want some tips for, you know, how to how to handle that, you just send me an email and I'll, I'll send you that on a side note. I'm going to do tips throughout this presentation as we go along, um, just because I didn't find a good place to put this stuff. So, so when you think you're at your wit's end, which you will if you go through a cat introduction process, all right? You need to find more wits. It's that simple because <laughs> you have to be the stable factor in this process and in charge as much as you can be. So why not just throw the cats together and see what happens? Well, the simple answer to that is because they'll fight, right? And why don't we just want to let them duke it out? Because cats have excellent long-term memories. All these scientific studies you see where they compare cats' intelligence to dogs' intelligence, the bottom line is, is that cats remember longer and, and that's significant, right? And you know, you've, you've probably had a cat and you go, he's, he's holding a grudge against me. I stepped on his tail by mistake and he won't let me forget it. That's because they have really long-term memories. A cat's long-term memories, 200 times that of a dog's. And they're highly selective about what they remember, by the way. You know, they don't remember that treat you gave them or that extra meal that you gave in to, right? No, they're going to recall what benefits them. And that's not necessarily the meal. They remember that you're the meal provider, and that certainly benefits them. But survival benefits them most of all, right? So they're going to hold on to memories of threatening situations so that they avoid them later. All right, and I wanna talk a little bit about anchoring. And if, you, if you've ever been in sales or you follow Anthony Robbins, you've heard of, you've heard of anchoring. 
and and how we use that with with humans you want to anchor an emotion to to recall well anchoring is very important with cats because cats and people are anchored much more strongly to a bad memory than you are a good memory right so the definition of anchoring is it's a cognitive bias where an individual's decisions are influenced by a particular reference or anchor. And once that anchor is set, subsequent actions, right, which means what you're going to do and how you're going to react to things may change from what they might have been without that anchor. Right. So for cats, and in general, this is cats, this is people, there's five keys to creating a strong anchor. And as we go through these, I want you to think about two cats not being introduced properly, right? The intensity of the experience. Well, when cats fight, it's, it's intense, right? The timing of the anchor, right? So, you know, it, it happens all of a sudden out of the blue. The uniqueness of the anchor, right? This cat, I've never seen this cat before. It came in out of nowhere and oh my God, it, you know, there it is in my territory and we fought and it was horrible. And the replication of the stimulus, the number of times it happens. So you can see that if you have two cats living together and you've allowed them to go on fighting without introducing them properly, they're just reinforcing that anchor that the other cat is a scary bad thing right and an anchoring bias means that during a decision making process whether i'm going to like this cat or not you're going to over rely on that information it's going to have a lot more influence on your decision on that initial anchor which if you just throw two cats together and they fight see if they get along and if not well then we'll do it right no because they've already anchored to that other cat and every time they smell them and every time they see that other cat they're going to recall this anchor this intense situation and they're always going to think of that cat as that intense situation so that's why we can't do that so how hard is it going to be you know you go well so how hard is it going to be to do this so before you start an introduction process between two cats consider some things have these cats gotten along with other cats in the past. And that's really important because if they haven't and they, they've never gotten along with other cats, your chances are they might not get along with this cat. Was the cat raised as a solo kitten? And the importance of that is, you know, when a, when a kitten is denied its developmental social relationships with mom and siblings, then it doesn't know how to be around cats. It also usually often has bite inhibition issues, but it doesn't know how to be. So a solo kitten is always going to be far more difficult to integrate with another cat than a kitten that was raised with a litter. And have they ever seen an adult cat since they left their mother? So if a kitten was adopted into a home, it was the only cat kept indoors forever, and now it's been surrendered to a shelter, and it's never seen another cat, you probably going to have more issues integrating that into a multi-cat household. And what happened when they were first introduced if you didn't follow the procedures I'm going to share with you today? Did they have a fight? Did they chase each other? It's going to make it much more difficult. And how much time have they spent coexisting badly? Again, sometimes people go years before they ever reach out to me. And that anchoring is so, so deeply rooted. It makes it very difficult. And have there been inappropriate eliminations like spraying? That also makes the level of difficulty much higher. And is one much younger than the other or sick or something like that where you have mismatched play styles or you're gonna have a six month old kitten you're introducing to a 12 year old cat. It's also gonna make it a little more difficult. So how will I know how it's going as we go along? You need to study the cat's body language closely and their postures for signs of stress. Because one of the important things, I'm getting a message that my internet connection is unstable. If it happens to drop and I go away, just sit tight, you'll be rejoined. Um, so this is a little chart from, from 
least stressed to most stressed. This is from the cat stress score that we use. You wanna know how's the cat's activity? Are they sleeping? Are they resting? Are they alert? Are they active? Are they trying to escape? Are they frozen motionless, right? What's their body posture? Are they lying on their side all relaxed? Are they crouched in a potato? Are they near to the ground? Are they shaking? Are they breathing? Watch the sides of the cat. You can tell, is it, is it panting? You know, is, is the breathing very rapid, which, it, which indicates stress? Are their legs tucked up under them, bent and stiff, or are they relaxed and just stretched, stretched out? Is their tail straight up, happy? Or is it lowered parallel to the ground, which means I'm weary and cautious? Or is it tucked, wrapped around their body, which means I'm very pensive? Is their head low to the ground, which means I'm kind of scared? Or is it upright and over the body and more relaxed? Are their eyes, you know, closed, resting? Because a stress cat's not going to close his eyes. He's going to be you know, eyes wide open, never, never blinking. Are they dilated? Are they staring at that other cat and not breaking stare? Are their ears forward, side or back, right? Those are easy. Are the whiskers forward and they're relaxed? You know, am I, am I curious and relaxed? Or are they flat back? When a, when a cat kind of holds his lips tense and those whiskers go back against the face, that means they're, they're pretty scared. Are they making noises? Obviously, are they growling? Are they purring? Purring can be stressful. You can usually tell the difference if you're familiar with the cat. And of course, are they hissing and yowling at one another? So make sure you're really observing everything that's going on with this cat from nose to tail as you go through this process. So time for another tip. Watch for positive signs like the cat rubbing items to scent them because that's a sign of comfort and, and it's an attempt to create a community scent. So it's like reaching out for a handshake in the cat world, right? When you see them rubbing the sides of their cheeks on the barrier door that's separating the two cats or the furniture in the room or that kind of thing, that's a really good sign. So you want to look for that. This is a chart um, that just kind of gives a little bit of that. You can see this cat moving through these you know, processes of, of relaxed to more stressed. And again, I can email this to you if you, if you want it. We won't take time to go through it today. So the $64,000 question, how long is this going to take? Not the, not the presentation, the introduction process. <laughs> All right. I can't answer that. I got to tell you, I, I can't, I can't answer that for you, but what I can tell you is this is a, a flyer that I, I like to arm shelters with to, to give in their adoption packets about how long it takes a cat to relax and acclimate to their new home. And this is just a cat in a home with no other cats, right? And coming into a home with other cats is gonna complicate this process and probably lengthen it. So they need three days just to decompress. They're gonna need three weeks you know, to just kind of start letting their guard down and feeling like, okay, I get this. I got your routines and I'm used to the sounds and I, I trust that no one's going to kill me. And okay, I'm feeling okay. And really it takes three months for a cat to really start to feel at home in a house. So when you add another cat to that and territory issues in that, then as you can see, this process may take a while. All right, so it's very important to understand through this process to control the things that you can control, all right? So what are those things that we can control? The trigger, all right? That is something that obviously evokes a negative response in the cat. Usually it's the other cat, right? We can control the trigger because we can control the duration, right? Which means how long is that ex cat exposed to the trigger? We can also control the distance, how far the cat is from the trigger. And again, you can just interchange the word trigger with cat in this. 
and you gradually increase one component at a time, all right? You decrease a component if another component increases stress noticeably. So basically, if, you if you're at a session and you're in 30 seconds and that is creating stress, well, the next session, you want to decrease the duration. Same thing with distance. So how do we control the trigger? You never lure a cat towards another cat. Don't think that exposure is going to make them calm down, right? This isn't a, a gradual desensitization process. This is a whole different thing. So you're not luring that cat over to the other cat. Oh, come on, come on. You'll like him. You'll like him. If you just get a closer look, it doesn't work. Slow down. Just stop what's going on if a cat is triggering. And avoid the trigger altogether is the real goal here. How do you control duration? You wanna train the cat to look or turn or come on cue. Now that's, um, that's operant conditioning, that is clicker training or cue training. You don't necessarily have to have a clicker if it's just one trainer, you and the cat doing that at home. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. You can also use a towel to obscure the view, the length of time that the cats are seeing one another. And you can train them to a carrier or place training. I find that's a little more difficult with cats. It's a lot easier to, to train look or come on cue than carrier or place when they're in a stressful situation. Training a cat to go into a carrier, go to place is easy in general, but not when there's a territory invader around. So I usually tend to, to look or come. And how do you control distance? Well, obviously with a barrier, which is a baby gate or a screen door or plexiglass. And again, we're gonna, we're gonna look at some examples of those because I find that that's the step where people seem to fall out the fastest, they get to that point where they've got to go to visual barrier and they can't figure it out and they quit. So you also control distance, visual distance with a towel over the barrier and with a harness and leash. So when we get to the point where you, you've got to control an aggressor cat, we'll teach them how to be on a harness and leash so that you, you can keep them from charging the barrier and charging the other cat. All right. Time for a tip. You want to do meet and greet sessions before mealtime so that you can use the meal to lure the cat back to the room. Now, this is late in the process once the cats are already spending time together. So let's talk about room setup because it's very important, you know, how we set these cats up in a house first. So there's two methods. There's a timeshare room or two separate sanctuary room. So basically a timeshare room is setting up one sanctuary room. And then of course you'll be switching cats out of those places. The new cat goes into the sanctuary room. And then at some point in time, you let him free roam the rest of the house and you put your resident cat in the sanctuary room. That's good to use if you're having redirected or non-recognition aggression, or if the cats have gotten along previously. If they're two cats, new cats, or two cats, home cat, and a brand new cat entering the home, the ideal situation is to have two separate sanctuary rooms set up, one for the resident cat and, and one for the new cat, all right, so that they can alternate times in the main part of the house and still have a sanctuary room of their own to go back to. So what do we set up in a sanctuary room? Make sure that you keep other pets out of that room at least a few days prior to bringing the new cat in. So hopefully the smells won't be too fresh. It requires you spending time in the room with the cat. So if it can be an office or you know home office or bedroom or some area, you're gonna be spending a lot of time during the day, that's ideal. It requires prey play sessions. So you need to be in that room actively playing with the cat. Food puzzles, the room needs food puzzles. 
an uncovered litter box, tall or long scratching post positioned by the barrier door. And the reason for that is cats scratch to claim territory. They have scent glands between their toes and on the bottoms of their feet. And so they're gonna associate that barrier door with the other cat and they're gonna to wanna to be claiming territory near the barrier door. So with the scratching post on both sides of the door, by the way, so your home cat has an opportunity to scratch on the outside and the new cat has a chance to scratch on the inside. Toys, of course. And if there's some way to put a smart TV in there, um, YouTube Cat TV, or the iCalm Cat, and you can just Google iCalm Cat. It's a it's scientifically modulated music that reduces stress in cats, and it comes with a really great speaker. You want to have that in the room so that it's a very calming sanctuary room. And if the cats are sensitive to one another, use a draft guard under the door to begin with to block scents. A lot of times, when you've got a new cat in a sanctuary room, you'll notice it'll go up to the door and it'll smell and then hiss. We don't want that. That's anchoring a negative experience and a negative emotion with the other cat. And we want to avoid that altogether. So if you see that going on, use a, a draft guard to block the scent under the door. So if the new cat is scared and hiding and hissing, and this might be a, an unsocial cat you're fostering or brought in, don't give him any reason to mistrust you too. He's already going to be freaked out enough about this cat he smells out there. Don't ever attempt to pull them out of a hiding spot. All right. Respect their need to hide. Don't stare. Staring at a cat is considered confrontational. Always approach with a sideways body so you look smaller and kind of look out of the side of your eye so that you're not making direct eye contact. You know, you do want to sit in the room and just read to them or watch TV or talk on the phone or just be there so that they get used to your presence without reaching for them. This is not good for cats that are feeling insecure. We have another um, YouTube video on, on fostering unsocialized cats and lots of podcasts. So a lot more detailed information there. But do let the cat make the first move with you and leave lots of treats and regular meals because they'll associate you with all of those good things. So before you ever let these cats see one another, here is your pre-introduction task list, all right? You wanna wait for the cats to be relaxed and confident in the sanctuary room as well as shared parts of the house, right? With the other cat's scents. This is ba basically a list of how do you know it's time to start an actual introduction, right? So this could be weeks, could be a month, could be three days. As you saw from that flyer I hand out, it's probably three weeks at least. You wanna feed canned food four times a day because you're gonna be feeding it on either side of the door so that we are having counter conditioning going on where the cats are associating each other with positive things like food. Now, if you have to work and you can't be there, there are food timers for that. Email me and I'll send you a link to an awesome food timer and you just set them when you have to leave and it's very easy. And there it is. You want to master prey play, right? You need to get really, really good at prey play. I, you know, people tell me, oh, well, my cat doesn't like to. He's not interested in it. I try it. He just, that's, that's on you. You're not doing it right. So learn to prey play where a cat really thinks that that toy is prey and comes after it because it's going to be very crucial in also counter conditioning positive experiences on either side of the store. You want to desensitize the cats to the gates, the barrier, and, and the doors so that they aren't scared of the things that the tools that you're going to be using in this process. You need to discover the, if you're not muting, go ahead and, and mute yourself. 
Um, you want to discover the best reinforcer for each cat. So this could be the squeeze up cat treats. It could be deli turkey. It could be chicken baby food. But you got to do your homework and figure out what each of those cats, like knock your socks off treat is prior to getting started here. You want to teach them to look or come or go to place or enter carrier on cue so that you can control the duration and the distance of this process. You wanna teach, harness and leash train each cat. And if you need some tips on what harnesses to use and things like that, shoot me an email. And you wanna choose, and you definitely wanna choose your visual barrier device. Sometimes they get complicated to get in and out of. So you don't really need to install it until you get to that step but you definitely got to figure out what you're going to use. And let's talk about that now. So stacked baby gates is popular, a screen door, right? You can, you can get a screen door and add it onto a door to a room. People have used plexiglass barriers. Somebody's not muted. Would everybody please be sure to mute yourself so we can't hear your background noise and conversations. I don't know who that is, but, um, and you're going to have to get creative here, right? So I'm going to show you some visual examples of what people have done. So this is a baby gate with another kind of baby gate. And I think it says up there what great cat wall of something, you know, this is one, let me move this over so you can see this. Um, this is a screen door installed on in the room. Here's another one. So another screen door, you notice it's latch. They put a latch in there. Um, and over here, this is the mountain of stacked baby gates. <laughs> I don't know how you get in and out of that room, right? When you, <laughs> with that, but hey, it works. Uh, maybe they have another door to the room. So here's one that a client shared with me. Um, so, and he said, for people who don't wish to push, put holes in their door frames or any of that. So he's taken a screen, like a full size screen. It's not really a screen door, but it's a screen for a, a screen door. In fact, he used one from their sliding patio doors and he put foam like the pool noodles, you cut them in the middle and you put it over the edge so they don't mark up the walls, right? And then they have tapes in there and the whole bit. And then he puts um, weights on this side so that it doesn't, um, you know, it can't be pushed out. And then at the top, he put a nail right at the top of the door frame and installed, clipped this string so that it holds it together at the top. And that's a, it, it's an excellent, that, that's a good one. I, I like that one. Here's another one, another client of mine used. Um, they, they had a door, I guess some door they either weren't using or this was a sliding door of some sort. And they put a piece of plexiglass again with the weight and the chair against it. So, they're, so there's just a little bit of view in there. And then they also had a screen in this place so that the cats could begin to smell one another. Here's another client situation. They had a glass door separating the cats and they were having a lot of aggression through the cat door. So this is not a reflection you're seeing over here. This is actually one cat eating on one side of the door and the other cat eating. And so they've taped up paper, like a frosted paper so that the cats can't see each other through it. This is an interesting case of mine. I had a client that had a bangle Carpe diem, he was a, uh, a breeding Bengal and they retired him for aggression. They were seeing cat, inner cat aggression in his offspring. So they retired Carpe and this lady adopted him. Well, then the lady wanted another cat, ended up getting another Bengal and we tried this introduction process and I'll show you a close up of their door. They have a, their, her husband, put like little wooden channels on each side of the door frame and then slid a, a plexiglass down between it. So 
what you're seeing on the right, this is Carpe Diem, and what you're seeing on the left, this is the new cat, you know, they swap spaces. It's important to use catnip in the hallway, again, so yeah. that the rolling around and scenting in the hallway, that's really good, encourage that. You can see over here, she's got a, one of those corner comb grooming things. That's another way for cats to, to place their scent right outside the sanctuary room. Lots of toys in the hallway, all kinds of positive interaction that's going on there. So we're, again, we're counter conditioning these two to the presence of the other cat. Somebody is not muted again, and we're hearing your TV. Please check your mute setting. I can't see who that is. Laura, please mute. Laura, I'm going to mute for you. Let's see. There we go. Okay. And this is, hold on. Okay, this is a close up of what they installed between these two bangles. And it needed to be a full size plexiglass door because um, the one bangle was highly aggressive to the other one. So you can see over here where he created these little blocks. He just nailed this wood into the door frame and then created like a little channel to slide this plexiglass down into. And he glued a, a handle, like a knob, on the plexiglass wall. So Follow play, like if you are, if the cats can see each other, if we're at the point where they're seeing each other through this barrier door and you're prey playing on one side of the door or the other, you want to cue the cat to look or to come right after playing because that teaches the cat self-control. And this is especially important if you have a young cat as one of the ones or both that you're trying to integrate. So let's get down to the brass tacks. The introduction steps, I'm gonna warn you ahead of time, there are 15 of them, 14 of them. And this does not include your sanctuary room preparation or your pre-introduction tasks, all right? So, which meant all those things we ran through earlier. All right, so the first thing you gotta do is prepare your sanctuary room, which was that list of like six things that we went through before. You wanna complete your pre-introduction tasks, which were getting them on a feeding schedule of four meals a day with canned food, mastering prey play, desensitizing the cats to the, the barrier devices and the towels and the doors, teaching the cats to look or come on cue, feeding, five feet on either side of the door and picking your visual barrier, right? So we're assuming all that's already done. So you wanna give the new cat at least a week to establish that sanctuary room as his territory and he'll be relaxed there. And during that week, you wanna be teaching that cat to look or come to your finger. I like to put my finger down like a few inches above the floor. Cats are usually very curious and they gotta come up and touch their nose to your finger and go, good boy, and give them a treat. And then walk a few feet away and do it again. Good boy, give them a treat. And they'll learn and then start saying come when they do it and they'll learn. Again, a whole nother webinar on clicker training cats. Um, we already have that somewhere. So um, we won't go into too much detail that today. You wanna put the resident cat in a sanctuary room and let the new cat out to explore. If he chooses, if he doesn't choose, that's okay, don't push him. You wanna repeat this process over the next week. So this is week two now, so that a communal scent is developed in that space. And you wanna gradually increase the time that the new cat is out in the house. So the first time you might only want to do that 10, 15 minutes. You don't want them to get too stressed, put them back in next time, maybe 20 minutes, next time 30. So gradually do that. If the cats are relaxed about taking turns in the house, install your visual barrier now, but make sure it's obstructed with something. So 
you want to put the visual barrier up, but you don't want it to be visible. So they can smell each other through it, but they can't see each other just yet. And that's if and only if both cats are really relaxed, which doesn't mean slinking around, crouching around, tail down, watching for the other cat. You know, you're seeing cats walk around with tail up, rubbing over in the spots the other cats have rubbed, rubbing your legs, looking very relaxed and comfortable. If they are not, then do not go to the next step. Take time, allow them the time they need to be comfortable with that space first. So then you're gonna allow the cats to see each other just briefly at a distance through the barrier. So this process always works a lot better when you have two people helping. If you're like living alone and you're trying to do two cats, it, uh, admittedly it's difficult, it's not impossible, but it's difficult. So let's say you're in the sanctuary room and the cat's sitting on the other side of the room and your home cat is you know, out in the hallway that's a good time to lift the towel, step out of the way, and just let them see each other. They might not even see each other. One cat might look and the other cat might not look. That's okay. Just for a few seconds, regardless of the reaction, and then stop, put the towel back down. If either cat shows signs of stress, then the next time, it's one second. It's literally just peek down, right? If both cats are calm, then the next time you do it, you're going to do it for five seconds. And I mean, just a count of one, two, three, four, five, close the curtain, right? So when the duration reaches several seconds, which I'm going to call, let's say, five to seven seconds, you want to say, look or come, you know, spotty come. And you wanna cue them away from the gate. If they do not cue away from the gate, stop the visual. You wanna increase the duration of look time before being cued to turn away. So let's say, towels up, 10 seconds, you do look and they look at you, that's great. And then the next time towels up and you go look and you want to increase that duration of the time that they're looking away. Also, when they are consistently calm with the barrier up, right? So now you've gone and you've increased it. It was 10 seconds yesterday. Today it's 30 seconds. There's no reaction. They're not staring at each other. You know, they're relaxed and looking away and, you know, grooming themselves and everybody's relaxed and no big deal, right? And, and again, the, the step amount of time between 10 and 11 can be a long time. It could be months, it could be weeks, it might just be days. It's gonna depend greatly on the two cats. So when they're consistently calm with that barrier up and they're like, no big deal, then it's time to remove the gate for a very short supervised visit with both cats on a harness and leash so that there can be no charging one another. And then you begin to increase the visit duration as long as calmness remains. If they're not calm, again, remember, you're controlling duration and distance. So obviously the first time they get together on a harness and leash, you really don't want them to go nose to nose. That's too quick. Keep them about five feet apart. Let them just get used to each other being that far apart and then stop. Let everybody go back to their comfort zone. And then the next time you do it, let them get about three feet apart and then stop. And as long as everything is progressing calmly and smoothly and we've had no hissing or running or crouching or things like that, then go ahead and let them get closer and closer. The minute that you see stress, you need to take a step back. You need to reduce the duration and reduce the distance. So that's what I just said. If stress is shown, reduce the duration <laughs> and the distance. So to recap, you're ready to remove that barrier only when 
Each cat will calmly and reliably stay in view of the other cat for several minutes. Each cat is calm when they make eye contact, right? None of that. Each cat will turn away from the other on cue. Both cats need to be willing to break the stare and look away when you ask them to. Otherwise, that means that they're still in confrontational mode and feeling like they're on defensive attack mode, like they can't turn away because they don't trust that other cat. That's, that's a key point of when trust is gained. All right, so when switching places, like when you're switching areas with the cats, you wanna put the free roaming cat in a carrier and then take them to a bathroom and shut the door and then move the other cat and then pick up the carrier and take that cat into the room and close the door and then release the cat from the carrier. I cannot tell you how many times, if I had a quarter for every time a client told me, well, I was switching cats and one got away from me and they accidentally got together and there was this huge fight or he accidentally slipped by my feet and got out the door. I could retire now if I had a quarter for every time I heard that, right? So you need to be responsible for switching these cats responsibly. And that means in a carrier, into a bathroom, move the other cat, and then take the carrier into the room, close the door, and then let the cat out of the carrier. Very important to do that process. So what does this meet and greet area look like, right? Once we're to the point that they're, they're meeting and, and you wanna set up a room. This isn't just free roam meet and greet in the, in the house. This is a room that you're designating is gonna be the meet and greet room. You do not want to have any inaccessible hiding spots. Okay, whoever just joined, mute yourself, please. Um, there we go. I think I got you there. Um, and that's because you want to create, well, let's say you, you do want to create a hiding place, but you want to be able to control it. So get a chair and put a towel over the chair so that they can go under the blanket or under the towel to hide if they want to, all right? You wanna start with a duration that's less than the duration you built up to with the gates. So if they were sitting there calmly looking at each other for five minutes, then your meet and greet start time needs to be two minutes, really short. You wanna cue them to turn to look away much more frequently when they're doing the meet and greet physically in a room. So you're gonna to have to have lots of treats with you and you'll be treating with what you have discovered is their highest value reinforcer. And you wanna end sooner. Don't wait for something bad to happen. That's kind of our nature. Well, let's just push it a little farther because if I let it go longer and it stays going really great, well, maybe we can get through this faster. Yeah, no, just end sooner, sooner than fill in the blank sooner than you think you should sooner than the cats think you should just end sooner always air on shorter sessions than longer sessions if you have and you probably will have one cat that's more aggressive and one cat that's more timid so you want to cue, cue the more timid cat to a high place. So in this meet and greet room, get a tall scratching post or a cat tree or a ledge or something like that, or a table so that you can get that cat to a high place before you bring the other cat in that's more aggressive. And when you're dealing with two cats like that, I usually will bring the aggressor cat in on a harness and leash, certainly at first for almost every session, so that you can control their desire to lunge. The goal is that these two cats ignore each other, right? That's the goal. And you want a reward for ignoring. That's what we wanna see. So if they're kind of ignoring each other and just sniffing around, toss them a treat. So it's really important that you prepare for the long term here, right? So let's say you get through this whole introductory process fine. How do we keep these cats, you know, getting along and not having 
territorial issues after you've done a successful introduction. You gotta have separate and plentiful resources. One more of absolutely everything other than people, the number of cats. So litter box is the most important and they need to be uncovered, right? So if you have three cats, this means you need four litter boxes. If you're telling me you can't have the time, you don't have the time to scoop four litter boxes twice a day, then consider reducing the number of cats because it's very important. They need to have four cat trees. They need to have four window perches, four scratching posts. There always needs to be one more than the number of cats so that they don't feel insecure about the resources in their territory. Otherwise squabbling will start. It's the absolute first thing I look at when I have intercat aggression cases. The more vertical spaces you can provide, the better. So Pico has like a climbing wall, climbs up and he's got a cat bed that's probably eight, nine feet in the air. And he loves going up there just because he's like, I'm tired. I want to still watch everything that's going on, but I want to be away from you guys. Well, if there's only one of those and you have two cats, they're going to be fighting over that. So if you have two cats, have at least two, probably three of really high vertical spaces bookshelves make great spots just make sure that you have two access points so if you make a climbing wall up to a bed there needs to be a way for those cats to get down over here so that they can't trap each other up there and create an uncomfortable situation lots of hiding places so that they can hide if they want to all right questions now i'm gonna have you guys unmute yourself and ask questions but i'm gonna ask a question that you're gonna that i've heard before you ask it. Um, I've had many clients, one that lived in a loft, right? I'm in one big loft space. I don't have sanctuary rooms. I had another client that was living in a trailer, which was basically just one big space. And how do I integrate a new, a new cat? Well, let me tell you what you don't do. We don't ever do a carrier confinement method. Some behaviorists will tell you, put the new cat in a dog crate or a carrier and put it out in the room and let the other cat come up and smell it. It's, it's one of the worst things you can do because the cat that's confined has been stripped of choice. It feels like it's trapped. It doesn't have an opportunity to run or hide or get away if it feels like it needs to. And it really creates a bad anchor of feeling towards the other cat if it's the one. I, I had a uh, inner cat aggression case where the lady was living this way, that she was had one cat in which she considered the aggressor, you know, would spend time in this tiny crate. And, and then the other cat, you know, would have free roam of the house. And this poor little cat was just stuck in this crate with no ability to defend itself and, and no proper introduction. So you'll have to create barriers in your space somehow complete visual barriers and, and a good bit of space. You'll have to learn how to carve up your space so that you know they can go through this process properly. Now, my email is there, if you can see that. So molly at catbehaviorsolutions.org. You can also reach me, molly at cattalkradio.com. And I'm gonna stop screen sharing now so that you guys can um, ask questions. Fire away. Chris, go ahead. Yeah, um, you were talking about way back at the beginning, we were talking about cats purring. Uh -huh. what, kind, what can you tell me about a cat who is clearly very happy and affectionate and does not purr? That just doesn't purr. Doesn't I mean, it, they're, they're not, the cat is not afraid. The cat is, you know, loving and sweet and everything. There's two, they're litter mates. They don't purr. It could be that their mom never, you know, they might've been bottle fed and then they were never around a mom cat who purred and they just never learned to purr. That, as far as I know, they've had their mom. They had yeah, their mom for their that's whole That's usually spring. it. And then the second thing I always wonder is, is that cat really 
as calm and happy as you think it is. You may be missing some signs, even though they're rubbing against you and that kind of thing, that mm -hmm. you just may not have found that, um, that hot button that they have that, you know, that whatever it is that turns their little purr machine on, that's very possible. But usually it's because they're not as relaxed as, as you might think they are. Okay. Yeah. Oh, pass that on. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else questions? I'm sure I have. Natasha. Hi, Molly. Hi. Um, yeah, so I'm in the process. Uh, I'm a foster fail. I just adopted. I fostered and then I adopted um, a little kitten from Dallas Pets Alive. Yeah. And I have a resident kitty who's nine years old, um, who was also, I just found her and, you know, she's been my baby for nine years. Um, so we have this new kitten in the house. Um, his name is Kurt previously Mowgli, but uh, his name's Kurt now. And so um, I did most of the steps for the introduction. Um, and this was just me just learning from the web and, you know, things that I picked up and, you know, I would have loved to have had this before, but I did my best and um, they're doing good. It's uh, Kurt, he's a kitten. So he loves, he wants to play with my big girl and um, it's hard to get him to, you know, stop chasing her. Um, I can get them together to eat. They love eating their deli meat together and we'll face each other and happily eat. Um, but as soon as the food's gone, he's like, oh, now I can play with this other cat. And she does not want to play yet <laughs> with him. Um, so I was just wondering if you could give me any recommendations on how to, um, kind of deal with that situation. Sure. So that is a challenge. As, as I said in there, you know, it's going to be harder when you have mismatched play styles, which is always classically younger cat, older cat. So you need to do several things. You have to be responsible for prey playing with that younger cat a lot so that he gets the opportunity to play with you because you can't stop that. He's got to play. I mean, it's just in his nature. He's a kitten and that's going to go on until he's probably a year and a half or so old. So you got a long time ahead of you that you need to do that. Another consideration is you could just go ahead and foster fail on another kitten about his age. And so he has, <laughs> he has somebody his own age to play with and he'll learn that the old cat's no fun to play with, but this new young cat is a lot of fun to play with. Um, you also run the risk of them both ganging up on your old cat, but most of the time they'll play with each other and bond in that way. When your old cat passes, then you'll have two cats the same age and you won't be doing this again later. Um, give your older cat a sanctuary room so that he has time and space by himself. You know, you'll notice patterns in the young kitten of times of day that his energy is higher than other. And so during those times of day, go ahead and give your old cat a place to be, you know, by himself and, and create a sanctuary room that's just his. And you can do that, you know, where you put him in there, or you could go as far as, you know, putting in a cat door that's got a microchip tag you know that it only opens for the older cat and the young cat can't even get in there and that way he can go whenever he wants to but those are the important things and always rewarding for behavior you want to see more of so again teaching that kitten to come on cue and when he does he gets rewarded especially if he's starting to get excited around the big cat then you go come and he and you cue him away from your older cat and he's rewarded for that. And then he'll begin to learn, oh, if I go away from that cat, I get great things. Those would be the things I would consider doing. Great, yeah, thank you so much. Sure. Anybody else, questions? Molly? Yes. Can you hear? Can you hear me? I can. It's Myra. It's Myra. It's Myra. He's still out of nowhere. Like he bites me, and I don't know where it comes from. It's like he is. He seems vindictive. You say cats aren't vindictive, but 
Well, that's a different topic. Well, you and I will deal with that at another time. Today, we're talking about introducing cats, and you definitely don't want to bring another cat into your situation just yet. (laughs) No, not until he's, I know. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I have another question. Yeah. But I'll wait for everybody else first. Anybody else? Okay. Yeah, just unmute yourself and jump in. Anna, did you have a question? Uh, I, I do. Hi, um, Molly. Thank you for everything you have taught us. That's that's awesome. I was trying to help a friend that has a cat rescue with someone that was fostering two cats from the same litter. And this person uh, did everything wrong that they could possibly do with cats. So these cats were super, super uh, uh, scared not not just normal wild like unsocialized but super unsocialized that they were super sure about um like you trying to pet them you trying to anything just about anything they would uh, they would hide all the time so we have worked through a lot to the point where they come and they brush against you uh, but if you touch them or try to touch them then they'll run away uh, sometimes now they have uh, a com- or overcome some of that, and sometimes you can pet them a little bit, but then they'll uh, they'll have like a limit, and it's it's not something consistent. They will. I have resident cats. They will play with my cats sometimes. Sometimes <laughs> they um, they'll just kind of like butt head and and. The security cat wants to play. My resident cat sometimes wants to play. Sometimes it goes on like this. Um, and uh, with the food, they do all uh, share bowls and share litter boxes. They share toys. They'll run around and chase each other back and forth. So it, it's inconsistent, kind of like. So my question would be how, if, if there's a way to improve that. and. We have conversation a lot with the with the food thing. Yeah, and so your question is to improve the relationships between the cats, or to improve the cat's social ability with people. Oh, well, all of it. How to make it more consistent for them, to where they can uh, have more trust with the human, and and the cats would be able to to be more consistent with their relationship if it's possible. Um. So again, socialize or fostering under socialized kittens. I have a a YouTube for that, that talks about that's kind of what Myra and I were talking about. You know, if you're telling me that a kitten runs from you when you reach to pet it, stop doing that. Let it come to you on its own terms. That's, that's number one is, you know, and don't be in a hurry to try to make that cat something that it's not right. We've got to accept cats where they are. And oftentimes, you know, we want that cat to be a cuddly little, right? Because of course, well, not all cats are going to be that way. And the only way to earn their trust is to stop flooding them. And so flooding is when you create an intense, you know, situation. So you reaching into their faces, that's flooding. They're like, I'm not comfortable with that. When a cat tells you I'm not comfortable with that, you need to stop doing it because every time you get that reaction, then that cat is distrusting you more and more and more. And you're creating those anchors that I talked about. They're anchoring that fear with you. So don't do that. Teach them to come. It's always a positive interaction. So if you put your finger about this far above the floor and the cat comes over out of curiosity and nose bumps it, you go good and you give them a treat, right? But don't reach to pet them and then move away and get them to come again. Then they learn, we do this a lot in shelters. This teaches them that forward movement towards hands is gonna result in a good thing, not an uncomfortable thing of that hand touching me when I'm not ready to be touched. Now you mentioned too, that one of your cats hisses at them. That tells me that, you know, obviously somebody in that situation isn't comfortable with the other cat. And, and so I think, you know, you probably ought to, you know, create some more space between those cats that are reacting um, stress. They're showing you signs of stress and slow down and, and go back through 
you know, this process that we talked about today. This is, I, I recorded this also. So I'm going to put this up on, on YouTube, on my YouTube channel. So, you know, if you, if you didn't join at the beginning and you want to go back and catch up, you can. And, you know, if you want to share with other people, feel free um, to do that. Anybody else? Chris, jump in there. Okay, you said earlier, you, when the cats were, you were saying when you were introducing the cats and getting them to the visual barrier and to um, <clears throat> cue them, you said it increased their self-control. And I wonder if you could elaborate on that a little bit, what you mean by self-control. Part of the problem is you dropped out. Part of the problem is, that. wait a minute, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that is, that is an important thing. So especially when you have kittens, all right, like she, like Natasha was asking, I have this young kitten and this older cat, right? The kitten's full of energy, just like a puppy. It's like trying to obedience train a puppy who's mm -hmm. just hyped up and not paying attention to you. So uh, first of all, what you said, getting them to the gate, you're never getting them to the gate, right? They approach the gate at their own comfort level. And we allow them to see through the gate as long as they remain comfortable seeing that other cat. So if they're not, then you're putting the towel down and obstructing that view with one another. So as long as everybody's comfortable and happy approaching the gate, that's the way it happens. We're, we're never gonna control, lure them to the gate. We're never gonna lure them to the gate because that's luring them towards the trigger. So what you do though, is you're prey playing. We got a wand toy and you're prey playing with each cat on either side of the door, right? So you're tossing a toy and the cat goes and plays with it. While you're having that play session, you pause and you go, look, Right. So and you and you train look every time a cat makes eye contact with you, you reward. Right. If we're clicker training, every time the cat makes eye contact, we click and reward and click and reward. And then we begin to put a verbal cue. Look. So cat looks, you say, look, click and reward. And then you begin to move that verbal cue farther and farther ahead. So when you begin to cue them to look, you're saying, look. And he'll look at you in the eye and then you, you reward them for that. So when you teach them to stop playing and follow a verbal cue, whether it's look or whether it's come. So I've just been tossing toys and now I'm telling you, come over here. If he'll stop playing with toys and come to you, that okay. teaches self-control, especially yeah. in a young cat. It, okay. it, it's very, very important with young cats to do that a lot, whether you're introducing other cats or not. That's that's a really good technique to teach them self-control throughout the rest of their lives. So they know that, um, you know, not to get all wound up with that. They, they can they can harness their own, you know, energy better. Is it as effective to do that or can it be, or is there a twist on it to use with adult cats who maybe are having some relationship problems? You know what I'm saying? To try, when you're trying to reintroduce or reacclimate each other. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this whole process works for reintroduction. Okay. Absolutely. Um, you know, but most people don't want to, don't have the patience to start from the beginning and do it right. I mean, most people don't have the patience when they're doing it the first time, which is why we end up with intercat aggression issues being one of the most common behavior issues. You know, my cats don't get along because I didn't take the time to introduce them properly. I mean, that's, that's what happens. We're always in a hurry. We don't have time to do this. We just want these two cats to get along already, you know, and, uh, and we don't have the patience and it really does take an incredible amount of patience and learning the steps and, and proceeding with those steps at the cat's pace in the order presented. Hold on. Yeah. Shireen, go ahead. Thank you. Um, hi, Molly. Um, so I know you're familiar with my situation. So I have six cats and 
So four are um, separated from the other two. Um, and what advice do you have for introducing them in groups? Do you think that is good or not? <laughs> it's, um, it, it, it can be if you have a, a home clouder of four cats and you're bringing two new cats in, you absolutely can do the same thing. Now, the cats are going to progress at different pace of one another. So in your four cats, you may have three of them that are approaching the gate and are calm, but you may have a fourth one that's still being really standoffish. So what you may have to do if that's the case, then you take the one that's being standoffish and you put them in a sanctuary room by themselves and you want to proceed then with the visual barriers and raising the visual barrier and, and that kind of thing with the others. Don't keep him isolated, but anytime he acts stressful about what's going on, give him the space to go a little slower about this. And then maybe you can introduce some of them faster than others. It is definitely difficult when you have that number of cats. Everything in life becomes more difficult when you have six cats, right? Your, your day is, a lot of your day is spent <laughs> caring for cats, <laughs> uh, which is why I have one, because um, I just don't have that many hours in the day to, to devote to that. But, but it can be done and you're on the right thought process of, of separating them you know think of your if your four cats are progressing kind of together all at the same level then you know you're going to have to put them all in a carrier or each in carriers put them in a room let the other two cats out take the carriers to the sanctuary room close the door let all those cats out so the switching places you know becomes more difficult but you pretty much have to progress with those steps in exactly the same way, you know, multiplied a lot. And you're going to have to probably go slow because you have to go as slow as your lowest common denominator cat. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank I wish you. there was a quick and easy answer for you, but there's not. There's no shortcuts <laughs> to this process. <laughs> if if you said this webinar is on, is on YouTube or it will be on YouTube. Yeah, I'll upload it on my YouTube channel. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Sure. Keep up the good work there. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Questions? Laura. Hi. Hi. So my question is, so I am fostering a kitten and I have a one-year-old resting cat. Um, but she she has a really old soul she is she just doesn't like doing much and she gets stressed out quite easily but i don't know i, I personally think that she has been doing pretty well and she doesn't mind the kitten most of the time and sometimes she's willing to play with it but what worries me is that sometimes i feel like uh she kind of uh chases a kitten and kind of just snaps at her she doesn't bite her she doesn't really do anything like and then I look at the kid and I, I of course I stop her but so I don't know if this is something like I should be like concerned about or how should I address it or or sometimes I don't know if she's just kind of letting her know to stop and give her space yeah but I don't know if she will through like chasing her all around the house and then doing that. Is that a way to tell her to stop? Um, sometimes. <laughs> I mean, it without seeing video of what's going on, it's hard to tell because I can't read the cat's body language. Older cats like to play too. So it, it may, you know, it, it may be play. Some of the differences to be able to tell the difference between our two cats playing, our two cats fighting is can, can either cat stop the interaction when they want to. So, you know, it, is she pinning down that young cat and that cat can't get away and it's causing stress? What kind of vocalizations are they making? If they're not, you know, like screaming and yowling and things like that, they're probably just playing. 
And, you know, and, and if they take turns, like if she chases the kitten and then the kitten will take turns chasing her, that's all indications of play. I, I do want to do a, um, a cat talk radio on video where I can play a lot of videos I've collected over the years from clients that have that exact same question. I think my cats are fighting and then they send me a video and I go, oh, they're having a great time. They're just playing, don't worry about it, you know? And uh, being able to tell that difference between playing and fighting is, is oftentimes difficult. But it sounds like play from what you're telling me, but if you can record it and email it to me, I'm happy to look at it and, and comment more. Oh yeah, I will. That would be super helpful. Uh, I just, uh, yeah, I was just wondering because I actually worked with cats for a while and I, I saw a lot of fights and it doesn't look like it at all. Yeah, but it doesn't sound I, like it. It, 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 sound, it, like, it looks like playing to me, but there's a point in which the kid and like does his at my cat and that's kind of like tell her to stop. Yeah. So I don't know if it's maybe that the, like, the play was too much for her, but it is play or... Yeah, now the kitten may be getting scared too. You know, the kitten yeah. may be like, okay, wait, it's too much, you're big, you know, and then and, and get, and get scared. And it sounds uh -huh. like they'll work that out. You know, it's okay because they're already introduced and you're not going through this initial introduction process. The older cat yeah. will learn that when the kitten hisses, it's enough. And as long as the older cat's respecting that and not continuing to, to press, then I'd say it's okay. And then you just might want to be sensitive to your older cat. Make sure that that these things aren't happening when that older cat is like, I've reached my limit. I've had enough kitten for today and then lashing out. And if that's the case, then do kind of what I was yeah. saying earlier. Make sure that the cat has a, a sanctuary space. It can go for a timeout alone when it needs to. You know, and make sure that you're burning off as much of that kitten energy as you can so that that too doesn't overflow onto more than the older cat wants to handle. Other people, uh, questions? Yeah. I'm a, I must be, my internet must Molly, I think you're muted. My internet dropped out. Oh, there you are. Yep, internet dropped out and I went into the ether for a minute, but I'm back now. <laughs> what I miss? <laughs> hey, Molly, I have a question. Yes. When, um, when the cat makes those deep guttural sounds, does that mean they're in distress or what is that about? Like, it can you hear depends me? on the I circumstances. Anytime, anytime you take a cat behavior or a cat body language and and vocal is part of it out of context that that answer is impossible so you'd have to know everything that's going on around the situation it could be they're seeing another cat outside it could be i'm in intense pain it could be you know any number of things um so out of context that's really hard to answer Okay. Anybody else? Questions? No? We good? Thank you everybody for joining us today. I very, very much appreciate you being here and being fosters and adopting new cats because if you weren't here then it means you just have one cat and you're not having this issue so it's always good for you to have more cats and have this issue <laughs> and if you have any other questions we didn't discuss today um, just feel free to reach out and email me a lot of things are covered on um, cattalkradio.com there too i have lots of resources available on my site so thanks everyone Thank for you. coming and until next time, keep calm and purr on. <laughs> Thanks, Thank you, Molly. Bye-bye, uh -huh. everybody. <laughs>